And after the Little Ice Ages, the ice started to melt. It began around 1440 AD. And there was no industrialization at that time. And so there was a Little Ice Age, you see, that's why. And the fact of the matter is, well, now we're in th through another warming phase. It's another warming phase, and uh, that's what we're living through, which is not to argue for pollution. I mean, I've been fighting pollution and trying to save rainforests for 30, 40 years. So don't put me in the category of being a polluter. I just like the truth. You see, also, Mr. Obama, if you study any history of the Vikings, you will learn this, and it's not in Alinsky's Rules for Radicals. The Vikings settled Greenland when it was green. That's why it was called Greenland. And they did farming and raised livestock. And Mr. Obama, again, you didn't find this in the tractates of Karl Marx, but when the Vikings settled Greenland, there was a period of between the year 600 and 800 A.D. And then what happened, Mr. Obama, is the mini ice age occurred from about the mid-1300s to the mid-1800s. And Greenland became covered with ice. And do you know what usually follows an ice age, Mr. Obama? I'm sure you know this. It's called warming, a warming age. And the reason you are able to screw the world with this big lie along with the bouncer from Rome who's coming here to do more on this is because people are stupid. They're not learning basic science. They're idiots. They're uneducated dolts, which is how a man like you could become president to begin with and get away with what you've been getting away with. The people are stupid. They know nothing about ice. They know nothing about warming. They know nothing about when, when ice melts. They know nothing about history. They know nothing about geography, nothing about geology, and they don't care. All they care is that you go up there in your billion-dollar airplane with your entourage spewing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and take a boat ride spewing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and lecture the world. You phony you. And this is the world you live in because of a community organizer like this. When I come back, the last hope for the United States of America and the world is Donald Trump. He'll be with us on the Savage Nation. Be here or be nowhere. All right, welcome to the Savage Nation, where uh, I guess borders, language, and culture prevail for the last 21 years. Let's not waste any time. The latest poll, Trump 30%, Carson 12%, Bush 8%. And we're going to have Donald Trump on right now. He's been gracious enough to come on the Savage Nation. Donald, so happy to have you on the show. Uh, thank you, Michael. It's great to be with you. So the polls certainly show that the people are responding to you. Do you want to comment on that, or would you rather move on to fundamental questions? Well, I'm just happy that it's, uh, you know, it, it is nice, because that means quite a bit to me. And, uh, you know, when I first... Uh, entered they all said i'd never run and then they said i'll never file and then i said they said well he'll never file his financials because maybe they're not as good as people think and i filed them and it was almost a hundred pages and they turned out to be much better than anyone ever had even imagined it's it's you know a ten more than a ten billion dollar net worth which i only say because that's the kind of thinking our country needs when we deal with china when we deal with japan and mexico and all these countries that are ripping us off and they won't be doing it for long believe me so you know, so it was. Uh, it's really nice to see the kind of polls we're getting. They're getting really phenomenal. Well, look, here's the thing. Many people are trying to rip you down because you're challenging the Republican establishment on many issues, including the economy. They're open borders traders. They're free traders, open borders people. I want to ask you about tariffs. Back in 2010, I published a book which, in which it was entitled uh, Trickle Up Poverty, in which I called for tariffs on goods from China, and I asked for 20% tariff on all goods produced in China. My opinion is, is that tariffs would stop their hollowing out of our industries. The industries would come back to America. I'd like to see their factories go empty, not ours. I'd like to see our, our factories working again. There are people in the radio business who don't understand business, Donald, who say that you're all wrong on tariffs. Could you explain to the world why tariffs are in the interest of the American worker? Okay, so simple. Look. We have a country, let's take China, and everybody's ripping us. You know, we don't have any country that we do well with, practically. But virtually every country is ripping us. Let's say China is the number one abuser. They devalue their currency. They just devalued it three weeks ago, the biggest devaluation in 20 years. They keep devaluing. It makes it impossible for our businesses to compete. And just so you understand, if you try and sell to China, 
If you are a, ma- I have a friend who's a manufacturer. They charge him a massive tax every time he sells. We don't because we we don't know what we do. We have leaders that truly don't have a clue. I mean, I think it's only that they're incompetent. I hope it's not worse than that, but they don't have a clue. So it's a one-way street. When China devalues, we should immediately put on a tax because all they're doing is sucking the money and the jobs out of the United States. I said the other day to somebody for the first time I said it, which is sort of unusual because I've been saying this about China for a long time. I said it's the single greatest theft in the history of the United States, <laughs> maybe the world. The money they've taken out, the jobs they've taken out. We've rebuilt China. I mean, we have actually rebuilt China. They've taken so much from us. Okay. So when you do the tariff for a tax, we call it anything you want, but when you do, you're neutralizing the damage that they're doing to you. And we have a one way. Now, I'd like to see no tax, and I'd like to see them even with us and not cheating us, okay? Okay, when right. You do the tariff, when you do the tax, what we're doing is neutralizing some of the damage that they're doing to us by taking our jobs and taking our money. You know, the interesting thing, we right now owe China $1.4 trillion. So think of it. They've taken our jobs, they've taken our base, they've taken our money, and we owe them $1.4 trillion. $1.4 trillion that we're paying interest on. That's like a magic act. So it's a very sad thing. That but it's not, not just chi- Donald, it's not just China. I've studied this in great detail. And products from the United States entering Mexico that do not qualify under the NAFTA rules are subject to Mexico's MFN rates of duty. And I have a tariff table. I won't read it on the air. I won't waste your time. They're awesome. They range up to 30% on goods that are not on uh, protected by NAFTA. But if you go to the bottom of the list, your hair would stand up on the additional import taxes and fees. Mexico has an IVA or VAT, value-added tax on most sales transactions, including sales of foreign products. The fact of the matter is we're being killed even by the Mexican government. Mexico is killing us, and they're killing us at the border, and they're killing us at trade. You know, Ford is building a $2.5 billion plant in Mexico. Nabisco just announced they're leaving Chicago, and they're going to build a massive plant down in Mexico, taking a lot of jobs. It, it's so incredible how, how stupid the leaders and the negotiators are that we have. Now, I have Carl Icahn lined up, who's a great negotiator. I have some of the greatest negotiators in the world lined up. That will wow. not happen for very long, believe me. That'll all end. It's a one-way street. Every country, and I would say virtually, you look at Brazil, you look at other countries, you look at Japan. How about Japan? They sell us millions of cars pour into this country. Millions yeah. of cars. They, they pour in. We give them beef, and they don't want it. You know, a lot of times the boats get over there, they turn it back. It mm-hmm. is, and it's perishable. It is a disgraceful situation, and the problem is that our leaders are not smart, and they're not cunning, and the world has taken advantage. And that's why we're losing so much money, and that's why we owe $19 trillion. Donald, I live near San Francisco Bay. I see ships coming in from Japan loaded with Hondas and Toyotas, and the ship is uh, weighted down to its waterline on the way in as they dump them up in Vallejo. I see the ships going back high in the water. The waterline is 20 feet above the bay. They're not even taking straw back with them from this country. The only thing they're taking back to China and Japan, believe it or not, is scrap metal. The same way uh, in the 1930s we were selling scrap metal to Japan. It's awesome to see history repeating itself. But I want to move on to national security, Donald, because to me the number one issue, of course, is the economy. But internationally, we know Obama's doing nothing against ISIS to speak of. He could bomb the training camps and put them out of business in less than a week, according to uh, generals who are retired and willing to speak out. If you were president, I hope you are, what would you do to stop this plague, this this plague of, of, uh, of, of people who are raping, kidnapping, murdering, selling young girls into slavery? It's something awesome to see the world standing by. As commander in chief, what would you do? Well, you would knock the hell out of the training camps, and that one's a given, and it's incredible that we don't do it, and we know where they are and we don't do it. It's almost like, are we protecting these people? These are the worst people. But you do that. I say you go and take the oil because a big portion of their wealth comes from the oil. You understand. They took the oil from Syria, from Iraq. They have a lot of oil. You know, they're redoing a hotel right now in Iraq or Syria. They're actually building it. They're like in competition with me. They're building a hotel. (laughs) I mean, you believe ISIS is building a hotel. And it's actually just completed. I hear it's very nice, but I don't think... Oh, well, are you serious? They're building a hotel? Yeah. I pray to God they're not going to provide captive children for sex parties. I mean, this is sickening. These people are trading in children as young as eight years of age in brothels, Donald. 
No, it's horrible. So it, it'll it'll end. Believe me, if I'm president, it'll end, and it'll end quickly. What do we do about all of the people that Obama has planted inside the government, who are so secure in the bureaucracy, inside defense, inside the Justice Department, and they cannot be gotten out? Could you use executive orders to remove some of the most radical of them? I think you get them out. I think we have a lot of people that now are bureaucrats and you know they talk about common core like jeb bush and a lot of people love common core and mm -hmm. i like local education but you have a lot of these bureaucrats in department of education i don't think they even care many of them don't care about your child's education and frankly there's so much fat in washington right now and there are a lot of people that just have essentially no show jobs in washington everybody knows it nobody talks about it and it'll stop Donald, do you think the government should be running our schools as they currently do? I don't, I don't think so. You just said so. I, I, think, I think we're talking about, you know, when you talk about Common Core, where, again, Jeb Bush and a couple of people that are running against me on the Republican side, they're in favor of Common Core, but Jeb is strongly in favor of Common Core. And I think that alone would be a reason, and he's weak on immigration, you know, very weak on immigration, as you know. Uh, yep. so, I don't know if you saw what I did yesterday with the uh, They Come for Love uh, <laughs> yeah, thanks. I did see that. That's the stupidest thing I ever heard Jeb Bush say. Who wrote that for him? I don't know. I don't get it. I don't get it. They come for love. In the meantime, you see what happened in San Francisco with Kate and so many other people. It's uh, it's disgraceful. But well, you know, yeah, and Kate, Kate's parents are filing a lawsuit against this crazy city and against Sheriff uh, um, Murky Kami and the others who who freed that illegal alien and who killed their daughter. It's crazy going on in America. What's crazy is going on in America right now. People are screaming about the illegal aliens. The number one uh, issue for you, I know that, and you would build a wall. By the way, I agree 100%. A wall is rather cheap to build. I don't know what these prognosticators are saying. It's so hard to build. As you said, it's harder to build a 50-story building than it is to build a wall. Uh, you want to talk about that for a minute? How hard is that to figure out? The wall is so easy to build. You know one of the reasons it wasn't built? You know, 15 years ago and 10 years ago, Hillary Clinton, everybody wanted the wall. You know one of the reasons it wasn't built? Because they couldn't get an environmental impact statement. Do you believe that? <laughs> we couldn't. Oh. They couldn't get it approved environmentally. Because they well, were it, there was probably a rep, there was probably a reptile on the border that would have been crushed by the wall, but I say walls work, and the best example, Mr. Trump, is Israel. Everybody forgets that the Palestinians were killing Jews left and right, blowing up discos, blowing up pizza parlors, and the Jews were building a wall with the West Bank. And the very same liberals who were screaming "Don't build a wall with Mexico" said Israel's racist, Israel's this, Israel's that. Don't build the wall. Guess what? Since that wall went up with the West Bank, I haven't seen one bombing. Right. You know what? It worked very well in Israel, and it works in other places, and it'll work great here. Now, you have to build a wall. You can't build a, like a little toy that they have now, where people just crawl over the fence, or they get a little ladder from Home Depot, and they walk over the fence. <laughs> build fences. I build walls. Do you ever see the precast plank where they do parking garages and, and roadways over highways? And, like, what they can do, and you stand it on end, and, you know, it's what I do best, in all fairness, what I do best in life, which is nice to have a president that knows about infrastructure, because because the, com the country, it is literally, our infrastructure is just dying on us. The bridges, the roads, the tunnels, the airports, Michael. So, anyway, but you get precast plank, very tall. You can go 50, 60 feet high. Nobody's going up 50. That's like a six-story. You drop it right into a footing, into a good, solid footing, and you've got yourself. And you could have it made beautiful. You'd actually have it as a beautiful-looking wall. You'd make it architectural. You'd make it beautiful. And people wouldn't get on it. And... There's no way you get through it. And you uh, wait. And I, I assume you would not. You would not have these planks built in China. I, I make that assumption. Built? No, 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 no. They'll be built right here. The, believe me, they're not being built in China. Donald, before you go, the polls are amazing. Huff Post, no less, tracking 149 different polls from 29 pollsters nationwide. Trump 30 percent, Carson 12 percent, Bush 8 percent. Would you? I know it's too soon. But people are asking because I feel a Trump Carson or a Trump Fiorina ticket would be a winner. I don't see how that could lose. I, I think that Ben Carson is one of the finest people I've ever seen come along. I don't think he's presidential material. I don't think he has the experience to run the office. I think he'd be a great vice president. What do you think? Well, I like him a lot. He's been very nice to me. He's been very supportive because when I was taking heat, he agreed with pretty much everything I said. So it's always nice. And uh, so I, I do like him. I think he's a terrific guy, actually.
but you're not willing to say who you'd pick for VP. You're not there yet. Say, I mean, I would certainly not rule that out at all. I think it's an interesting choice. It could be a very good choice. But we have to see really where we are, the landscape, in you know, six, seven months from now. Let's see. First thing I want to do is win. After I win, I want to, you know, make a great choice, and I'll be talking to you, and I'll be talking to other people, because, frankly,